We're going to look at two short passages in chapter 9. Uh, a lot of this is repetitious, so I'm not going to take our time to deal with it. Uh, you can read it and take it in yourself. But he's, he's going back over wisdom and toil and power and authority in chapter 9, uh, chapter 8 rather. And uh, basically when you're dealing with powerful people, you better obey them and better not go against them. Uh, he used a king. I forgot I had this on. I'm sorry to say I'm getting used to it. I don't want to get used to them. Uh, I'm ready for it to end. But he's, um, he's using the king, which was his setting of someone in authority, and basically encourages people, you might not like it, but you better follow his commands. Uh, he has the authority, and you have very little. But that's something we understand, and it's already been dealt with. He deals with death in chapter 9. And I want us to go to, uh, to verse 9. Uh, basically, we're all going to die, the first half of the chapter. Death is the destiny of all of us. Some take the principles that are mentioned there and suggest that he believes uh, that there's no life after death. But remember, he's looking under the sun. God is out of the picture. But I want us to go to verse 9, chapter 9, verse 9. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days, or vanity, or, or vain days. For this is your lot in life, and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you're going, there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. And that's a quotation that's used many times in other subject matter, encouraging us to be diligent in our work. And we tend to quote some of the Proverbs, also written by Solomon, but certainly using verse 10 uh, in other contexts. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave where you're going, there's neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. And those are the three subject matter that he's dealt with in the first eight chapters in a cycle of two, so at least twice with some detail. Um, turn the page... And let's go to chapter 11. And again, it's repetitious, and I just, with the quarter about to end, I wanted to stay on a little bit of a schedule. Uh, but we need another week after tonight, and we're singing next Sunday. By the way, the new house to house was delivered to the building and delivered to 1,500 houses in our zip code. There's about 15 or 20 here. If you did not get one this week, take one that's here. We received some extra. We're not sending as many on a monthly basis, but we're rotating them a little bit uh, in the zip codes. Uh, so take one, read it, pass it on to someone else. They're here. Uh, there's a point to where we have to throw them away as they pile up, and we don't want to do that. And uh, take it and share it and enjoy it. It's a, another good addition. Solomon uses some terminology that a merchant would understand, but it has an application for all of us in chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. And that's a principle that would tell us that we need to take chances in life. We need to live in faith. And if you're putting seed, and this is what it's talking about, if you're putting seed on a boat and sending it out to sea, a lot of things could happen to it. 
weather, uh, just a number of things could keep that seed from reaching its port to where it would be planted and bread is grown. Cast your bread upon the waters. Take a chance and see the end result, he's saying. Don't see it as seed going on a boat. Don't see the dangers that could occur as that seed is leaving the harbor. See the end result. See it and plan on it, although things could happen. Um, we can all think of times in our life when we weren't sure about a decision that we needed to make. And there were no guarantees. And we prayed about it. We talked about it as families, with a spouse, as children perhaps, as you listen to mom and dad. And there's a point to where you're willing to take the chance in order to have the benefit that can be reaped. And that's true in a lot of areas of life. And so Solomon is encouraging us, live life as an adventure. Live by faith. If you go to the extreme of the application, especially in the New Testament, cast your bread upon the waters, for after many days you will find it again. So sow the seed. Be willing to let it run its natural course. It may take a while. In many days, you will find it again. So you have it at some point, and you're concerned about losing it. He's saying, don't be concerned about it. Cast your bread upon the waters, and you will have it again. You'll have the bread, if you will. Uh, does that help us to have that kind of thinking in mind? And, of course, a Winston and out audience as you are, this isn't a new thought. This is a reminder of some of the things you've done many times in your life. It's something that you've trusted God in. You've taken the chance, if you will. You've made the tough decision, and you've given the time necessary to reap the harvest. Um, my granddaddy had a farm, mostly garden, some trees, occasional, or some fruit trees, occasional uh, other animals, but not usually. Two of the great delights of my life with him, one of them involved watching him enjoy the fruit of his labor. I'll never forget one day when the onions had been dug up and it was the first of the season. And this is what granddaddy would do. That's what we called him. He reached down and took one of those onions and wiped it on his shirt and took a bite. It was just pure delight to have the crop in. Did the same thing with the first tomato. He took that tomato, usually pretty good sized ones, I called them sandwich tomatoes, and he took the first one that was ripe and just wiped it on his shirt or overalls and just bit into it. It's the blessing of doing the work, letting time take its place, but wanting a harvest. If you never plant the seed, what's going to happen? Wouldn't it be nice if something would come up anyway? What does come up if you never plant the good seed? Weeds. Uh, we took a picture of, there's two weeds along the road between our house and the church building. We walk up and check the mail. And uh, as we walked up yesterday, there's the meanest, ugliest, dark green weed with thorns on it, this big around. Another one is smaller. And I says, Terry, do you have your phone? I forgot to put it in my pocket. I took a picture and sent it to my children. I says, this is the personification of sin. This is the personification of sin. Where did weeds come from? Satan and sin. And it was the worst weed I've ever seen with multiple thorns coming out of it. Terry's going to come and dig it up. She said, I've already dug some between the three places. But uh, 
If you never plant the seed, that's true of the seed of the Word too, by the way. Plant the seed to where you have an opportunity of a result from that seed. And two out of three aren't good results as far as lasting fruit. But uh, you've got to plant the seed. And that's what Solomon is encouraging. And then he says, Give portions to seven, yes, to eight. What he's saying in metaphorically, and don't be shy. Give excess. Plant excess. Seven, that's the complete number, according to the Hebrew lettering, if you will, of numbers. I used to call it the perfect number, but I was corrected a few years back. It's the complete number. And then he says, and even eight. Go a little extra. And, for you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. Financial reversals, as far as the seed. Do your best, have faith, and even a little extra. Even a little extra. You just don't know what's down the road. Those of you who have farms and have planted in the past... uh, I don't have much good experience with it, and it was always watching Granddaddy uh, for the most part. But I don't think you put one seed in whatever separation that you want when you're planting seed into a ground and just putting one seed at whatever appropriate distance. Don't you usually put a couple? Don't you usually put two or three there? And if you have to come and pull some up and transplant them, you're covered You're allowing for the fact that maybe some of the seed won't produce, and you're not taking a chance. And that's the principle that he's talking about. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're ensuring something to come. The Thagard is sharing a cotton experience and the work that's necessary in order to be sure that you have a product. You've got to have a crop. And uh, that's the principle. Let's go further. If clouds are full of water, they pour rain upon the earth. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north... In the place where it falls, there it will lie. So he's talking about seeing something and responding to it. Here a farmer. If you see a cloud, watch the assumption. It's going to bring rain. James talks about the false teachers who are like mist, who promise something, and the rain doesn't come. It's a false hope. But here, if the clouds are full of water, they will pour rain upon the earth. And he's suggesting if you've put the seed out, seeing bread as the finished result, and the rains come through the clouds, you will have a product. You'll have a result. Whether a tree falls to the south or to the north, in other words, it doesn't matter where it falls. In the place where it falls, there it will lie. So there's some things that are final. It's going to happen, and it's final in its result, just like a tree that falls. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Now, can you see what he's suggesting there? Look beneath the words He's talking about someone who had faith, but now he's going the other extreme. He's talking about people who consider the risk, and they're just watching and waiting until there's no risk. If you're waiting until there's no wind, you're always waiting. If you're watching, the idea is waiting and not moving forward. If you're watching 
and looking at the clouds, you'll not reap. Waiting for the right time to act is his words in other places, but the uh, intention here is foolish. Cast your bread upon the water. When there's rain, it will rain. And if a tree falls, it's going to fall. You don't have control over some things. You don't have control over nature, certainly the farmer. And the patience of Job in the book of James. I think I misquoted Sunday when I mentioned the faith of Job. And I mentioned New Testament without saying James, I think. And I realized it later. Uh, but that's why we know it's a real person. It's a true story. But things happen. And they don't cause us to have a lack of faith, to act, if you will. As you do not know, and there's the key, if you circle in your Bible, circle that, as you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb. So you cannot understand the work of God, the maker, and the New International Version is the capital M, uh, maybe the author and other translations, but the maker of all things. And uh, it's interesting that he goes from gardening to a fetus in the mother's womb and what's involved there, how the body is formed. Uh, another uh, statement that would teach us that life is at conception, it's not at birth. And the Bible acknowledges that in several places. Uh, that's life before it's born, if you will. But the point, there are things in life we don't know. We operate on faith. And we don't understand the work of God. Are you uncomfortable not knowing everything? And I'll, I won't add anything to that. <laughs> Let's just take it from there. Are you uncomfortable but not understanding everything? If God gave us more to understand, could we ever have the knowledge that he has? When Job was saying, give me an arbiter, an umpire to come and let me t state my case. I don't know what's going on. I don't appreciate it. I'm not the worst of sinners. My friends tell me I am. I, I want you to just come and let me... Uh, umpire, give me an umpire, the modern translations. Because he wanted to state his case to God. And God takes him for several chapters across the creative universe. Where were you when I put the sun and the clouds and the stars? And then he names animals. Where were you, Job, when I created these things or placed these things in the universe? just to get his attention, some detail, but it wasn't much at all compared to what he created. God gives us enough to trust in him, and if we trust in him, we're thankful that he doesn't expect us to know and understand all that there could be. How can we? You cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. And there's a very specific principle stated there. We just can't. Uh, I've told you the statement I made to my dad a number of years ago that I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to get in the long line to ask God this particular question. And it's something that we were talking about, something on our mind. He just looked at me and kind of shook his head. He says, Gary, when you get there, you're not going to care. I said, I'm going to. I want to know. He said, you're not going to care. And uh, I needed to hear that, I guess. <laughs> it's truth. I've never doubted it. Some of the things we would like to know from God at some point in life, before we get there, we realize it doesn't really matter. We might still care to know what we'd like to, but we realize it doesn't really matter. We're not going to understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So, he goes back to his opening principle. So, sow your seed in the morning. 
and in the evening let not your hands be idle. For you do not know which will succeed, whether this or that, or whether both will do equally well. Isn't that a pretty amazing, simple principle to live by? Somebody that's gone through life and gone through a variety of places in his neighborhood and he's showing us the vanity of all of that and the need to put our trust in God and find the enjoyment that he allows us to find even in work and then coming to, toward a conclusion. Sow your seed, cast your bread upon the waters, and at evening, let not your hands be idle. You're still depending on God. Is the principle, although there are some things you can do in the evening. It's not suggesting that it's just during sunlight, if you will. Could be later in life. I don't think it's really going to that in this example. But um, you don't know where the success will come from. Your faith allows whatever result there is and you don't know, but you give it to God, the maker of all things, not understanding where the success will come from. And it could be a double success. Both, that print in principle, both things could come forth. It could be an equal product, if you will. Again, in principle, because... There's a variety of seeds and things that could be in play. Comments or reflections? It's interesting. You, you know, talking about Job and, and his seemingly little problem compared to what God has done. Mm hmm. I just thought of a statement that Paul shares with us. I think it's 1 Corinthians 2. He's talking about wisdom there. And he makes the comment that the wisdom of God is so inferior to what, to what we would assume, if you will. It's so above us that it's just no comparison. But he said in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood for it understood it, I'm sorry, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And he's talking about the secret wisdom, verse 7, uh, that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. And so that's that foreordination of the need of a Savior, knowing we would sin. If the rulers of this age knew what the death of Christ would bring forth, that's what he's saying, they wouldn't have crucified him. If they just had some clue, that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory if they had understood what he had planned ahead. But then he says this, However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. We just can't comprehend it. If we saw it, it would make a difference. If we heard it, it would make a difference. If we conceived it in our mind, it wouldn't have made a difference. It's just outside of our reckoning what God has prepared. But, verse 10, God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. And that's the Holy Spirit. And, uh, of course, the first century apostles were given an understanding because of the miraculous gifts that they received to where they could begin to understand it. The Spirit revealed some things that otherwise could not have been understood. Uh, other reflections. What's the biggest mistake you made that you look back on if you just had 2020 vision 
You don't have to share it. Just think for a second. 2020 vision. What would you have done differently? We've all had times like that, I think. We've had times where if we knew then what we came to know, it would be very different. Whether it's a stock that you would have bought, that you would have benefited greatly from, or something. If you'd understood the weather, if there's things that if you'd known then, you would have planted so-and-so crop. You would have cleared so-and-so partial of land. Life is filled with times if we knew the future, even a close future, we would do things differently. But we don't. But we live by faith. We do the best we can. And uh, hopefully we don't look back with regrets. Um, well, he begins summing up and those who separated verses when they put together the English Old Testament just really messed it up. 11.7 never stops in its theme until the end of the book, which is chapter 12. Light is sweet, and it pleases the eyes to see the sun. That's S-U-N. However many years a man may live, let him enjoy them all. But let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. Everything to come is vanity. Solomon is telling us that we need to accept things by faith as they come and give it to God and realize that there's sun, S-U-N, as well as darkness. And we know darkness is coming at the end of the day, but he's talking more profoundly the end of life, if you will. Because of what we see is coming, don't miss seeing the sun. And he says that the light is, sleep, or the light is sweet and it pleases the eyes. Don't miss out on the pleasure because you know at some point the darkness will replace that time. Live in the moment and enjoy it even though you have an idea of what the future may have in mind. My dad at funerals would say, and I said it at his and at mom's funeral, and it was said at my grandparents, a Christian lives every day for that day when we go and gather to celebrate their Christian life. We live every day for that day with an awareness. There's a time to laugh and cry, time to be born and a time to die. That's what it's all about. And to miss out the joy, the sweetness, if you will, of the light, because we know it's not going to be forever, is to miss the sweetness of the light. It's going to be is to miss out on that blessing. And most of us, we have a whole lot more light than we do the darkness. Even if we're in poor health for a number of years, usually we've lived several decades to get to those smaller number of years. So that's an attitude. Um, Gregory got home from what was amounted to boot camp at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina Sunday. He's home for three weeks before he's deployed to Bahrain. And so we said, well, when you're driving home, call us so we can talk and catch up. And so as he was going through North and then South Carolina, we talked on his speakerphone, and he shared some of the things he went through. It's, it's like boot camp again, and he shared some things that were really hard physically. He, Terry just winced when he told us about a 50-pound vest that they had to wear for protection with boots and holding an, a gun with a full uniform and a helmet on. And they had to jump in water and maintain however, whatever they had to maintain in order to get out. 
And they had to train for something like that happening. He said it was really interesting. And he shared something else. It was really interesting. I says, Gregory, do you know what you're doing? You're doing what we were told in China. Don't think of it as frustrating. Think of it as fascinating, where your word is interesting. That's really interesting. And you have learned to handle the stress that you were under physically and mentally, emotionally, by looking at it as being interesting. In principle, that's what he's telling us. Life is interesting. Life is fascinating, the Chinese workers were taught. And I repeat that from time to time, and I can't help it. It's just such a strong principle for life. Well, let's go forward. Be happy, young man, while you're young. And let your heart give you joy in the days of your youth, verse 9. Now, remember, he's just suggested Light is sweet, it pleases the eye to see the sun, but there's darkness on the horizon. So he goes specifically to the youth, those who are young. He's not suggesting that it's preschool children, elementary children. He's talking about young adults for the most part. Enjoy life. And some of the commentaries went to great lengths to tell us, let's be sure that we don't degrade the young people when we read these next verses. Young people sometimes think they're going to live forever. They're immortal in their mind, and so they don't always have the safety in mind that they should. And that's true with some. Young people don't sometimes plan for the future in some ways. Some don't. Many do. So we're not suggesting an extreme with the next verses, but he's saying, in your youth, enjoy it. Let your heart have the joy that could be there. Remember, don't contrast it with knowing that life is difficult and all this is going to change. He's coming back. Follow the ways of your heart. And whatever your eyes see, but know that all these things, for all these things, God will bring you to judgment. It's not unbridled enjoyment without boundaries, without consequences. But he puts that in to be sure, because remember, he gave himself over to pleasure. 300 concubine and 100 wives all the wine that he could receive and grow in vineyards that he planted even more. He, get, he enjoyed pleasure to the excess in every way in the early chapters and saw it as vanity, and so he's already taught us that. But enjoy your youth, knowing that, yes, it will change. But remember, there will be judgment So then, banish anxiety from your heart and cast off the troubles of your body for youth and vigor are vanity. Wouldn't you love to be young again? I'm curious. Only three of us? Huh? Well, that's okay, though. Where would you limit it? I don't ever want to be a teenager again. I would like to run two half miles in two state meets again. I would like to have those two to run again with the confidence that I would have later in life. I'd love to redo that, but not much else. Would you want to go back to college or those first years of the 20s? in whatever direction they took? Would you want to go back to the first 10 years of marriage? Or is the last 10 pretty good? Again, enjoy it as it's happening. And sometimes we wouldn't want to go back. We would, can be selective if we had that opportunity, but we don't. And remember, we said last week from verse seven, or chapter 7, I think, it's just really not healthy for us to say the good old days. 
to live in the good old days mentality? Well, banish anxiety in your youth. Cast off the troubles of your body in your youth and enjoy the vigor that's there. Enjoy what it gives you or brings into your life. Um, I don't remember who I heard say it in what show a number of years ago, but it made the comment that they were talking to someone who was much, much older and talking about life and circumstances. And they looked at him very nonchalantly, but very plainly says, you were old the day you were born. And I remember kind of smiling. Some people were just mature early. That's what it was saying. You were old the day you were born. That doesn't mean you can't enjoy youth. It doesn't mean that, but it's not sticking to that, obviously. So he... He begins his summation. That's a long summation of the whole chapter. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth. And the Creator, uh, like the Maker in the previous chapter, is capital. God is the Creator. Before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Now, I'm not going to go any further. I don't even know how much time we have good. Uh, we may stop a little early because I don't want to go into the conclusion because it's all together on purpose. And if you haven't studied chapter 12 recently, it's going to point a finger very specifically to some of us who are getting older. It's going to examine the human body in metaphors. It's going to examine the old body as it's grown old and let us see it during that time and then come to a final conclusion for the whole chapter. You can read it. It's okay if you read it before next week or if you remember it from having studied, but he's, he's going to use metaphors to look at the aging body, literally the aging human body and make some conclusions at that point. But he's encouraging us to live a life of faith. Enjoy the time of being young, vibrant, healthy. The world was in your hands. Uh, the future was out there in front of you. He's trying to bring all of that into our awareness. Any comments, questions? I'm going to stop because I don't want to go forward. I want to do it all at one time. Next week we sing. Those of you who lead singing, pick out a couple of songs. Invite others to come. Let's get it closer to what it used to be so the singing can be the best that it can be uh, as far as the numbers and the enthusiasm and the participation. Pick up a house to house, read it, share it with somebody when you finish. Um, it's, it's an excellent, excellent uh, publication. I think I was made aware two weeks ago, Alan Webster has taken a new position in a new city. Uh, he's leaving some of this behind and others are taking up the mantle. Uh, the, a congregation that I'm very aware of in Murfreesboro is helping to do some of the billing and distribution and other things. So from Jacksonville, Alabama, it's gone to other people and other places, but it looks like the quality is going to continue. And I'm sure the ones who began it so many years ago want that to occur. Uh, it's a really good publication. Thank you. I want to make one more comment. When we were in South Florida, we had a 
member of the congregation who had family in Michigan. And every two years, she would get in her car and drive by herself to Michigan. Uh, it was two full days. She was 84 on the first trip that we were aware of. And she made it at, in 86. And she had stops planned along the way. And she went at a time where the weather was not a concern. And one of the ladies that we knew well said in front of other ladies, and it very quickly resounded from others, says, I hope when I grow old, I'm as young as you are. Uh, and it was just their way of saying that you aren't letting age slow you down. And you're a good driver. Your, your car's in good shape. She just decided she was not going to let it slow her down. And they wanted to be like Mildred when they grow up, they said. Uh, but anyway, we think of her often. She's now on the other side.